Hello and welcome back to the annotations for an inspector course. In today's video we are looking at the beginning of Act 3. So we are looking at um, Eric being interrogated. So at the start of Act 3 again we have the act which is basically beginning as if nothing has happened. So it says exactly as at the end of Act 2. Eric is just standing just inside the room and the others are staring at him. Um, so I've said that this begins um, giving the illusion that nothing has changed, but the audience know that things have. So the audience know that the family know more about one another. They know the secrets that the family have. Um, and even though things look exactly the same, things have changed in a big way, which of course could respect, um, reflect the changes in attitude that people had in their politics that people still looked exactly the same but now they were more socialist um, and our first annotation is when Mrs Burling says Erica can't believe it there must have been some mistake so here she's acknowledging um, refusing to acknowledge it's true so she's refusing to kind of see Eric for who he is which is kind of reflecting the distance in their mother and son relationship and Eric reflects that they don't they're not close and he says bitterly, um, you haven't made it any easier for me, have you, mother? So he is referring to that um, repeated kind of speech that she gives where she blames the father and says that he's entirely responsible. Um, and again, it's kind of showing the distance in their family. But also is kind of starting to show the hypocrisy of Mrs. Burling. And she says, I didn't know it was you. So suddenly, because it's her son and potentially her reputation which is on the line, she suddenly has had a drastic U-turn and doesn't think that it's the father who's res entirely responsible. Um, and so she says, you don't seem the type, you don't get drunk. So she's still in denial about Eric's behaviour um, and still in denial about how much she knows about him as well. Um, which is kind of then ironic when before the inspector interrogates him, he miserably, so again is kind of showing his regret and how much he's changed and how remorseful he is, says, could I have a drink first? So this, in addition to the stage direction, that his whole manner of handling the decanter, so the decanter is the bottle that the alcohol was in, shows his familiarity with quick, heavy drinking. And heavy drinking just means he's drinking a lot, but he's drinking it quite quickly. Um, so it's again showing his guilt, but also that he's dependent on alcohol. So his actions are directly contradicting his mother's opinion of what he's like. We then start to have Eric's interrogation. So the inspector starts off quite simple. So where did you meet her? And he says in the palace bar. Um, so we have this um, idea of it being similar to where Gerald met her firstly. So they both met her in the palace bar. Um, and you have this association firstly of it being a theatre. Um, so that's where you're acting and pretending. So it's the bar is attached to the theatre. But then there's also that association of drinking. And when you drink and you drink a lot particularly, that's when you start to um, lose control over what you're doing. So here Priestley is kind of suggesting through the fact that they're both meeting Eva Smith in the palace bar. This idea of upper class people pretending to be a certain way also but also losing that control over their pretenses because they're drinking. And this is reflected then when he says, I was a bit squiffy. And we know that squiffy was a slang term for drunk. So he's already drunk by the time he met her. So in this part, we start seeing the description of Eric and his interaction with Eva Smith. And it's quite similar to Gerald. So they're both noticing that she does, she stands out because she doesn't quite fit in at this bar. Um, and... Eric says she wasn't the usual sort and then goes on to talk about how um, he went back to where she was staying. So her lodgings is where she was staying. And here we're starting to get an impression that um, Eva didn't want him to come with her. And that it's again this idea of upper class people using their privilege and power within society to kind of make working class people do things that they don't necessarily want to do. So we have words like insisted, 
it seems. I'm not very clear about it, but afterwards she told me she didn't want me to go in. So it's this idea that she didn't feel like she could say no to him. She didn't feel like she had enough power and authority to actually turn him down. Um, which is where the power imbalance in their relationship becomes really clear. Um, and it gets worse as he goes on. So he says, I was in that state when a chap easily turns nasty and I threatens to make a row. So we have here this these use like nasty threatened row it's suggesting that he would be aggressive if Eva didn't let him inside so it's this idea that she um was threatened by him essentially and that he's aggressive when he becomes drunk um and so it's kind of implied that he raped her um not in the sense of kind of physically forcing her to sleep with him but by ignoring the fact that she wasn't consenting to his arriving at her lodgings um but also this threat that if she didn't do any do what she wanted he would become aggressive and nasty um so here we have an immediate reaction so it's kind of oh eric how could you um and burling wants the women to leave the room so it's this immediate kind of let's limit how many people know about this um so the women leave and eric goes on and says i couldn't remember her name or where she lived it was all very vague so here there's no details unlike gerald so gerald kind of brought her to the hotel and started to the palace hotel um and started to have a conversation with her and learn more about her there's clearly no conversation happening here or he was too drunk to remember it but they happen to meet again at the palace bar um which is when their relationship started to develop a bit more and they talked a bit. She t told me something about herself and I talked too. Told her my name and what I did. So here we're seeing lots of short sentences which shows he feels tense. So potentially guilty. Um, and they continued to see each other after that. And a few times afterwards she told me that she thought she was going to have a baby. She wasn't quite sure and then she was. So here they're seeing each other several times and Eva potentially was pregnant with his baby. And then there's a certainty later on. But again, there's lots of short sentences. When Eric is being interrogated, he's um, sticking to the facts. And he's sort of saying it in chronological order. He's not elaborating on it. Whereas in contrast to Gerald, who kind of um, is quite wistful, so quite emotional when he's remembering um, his interactions, which shows he had feelings for her. Eric is just very factual. This happened, then that happened. Um, which is kind of showing his guilt that he recognizes that he mistreated her and abused his power um so the inspector says did she suggest that you ought to marry her and here the suggestion is entirely on eva um which reflects women in 1912 this idea that um women would basically be worse off by being un an unmarried parent than a man a man could easily pretend that the child wasn't his uh, a woman couldn't because she would be walking around invisibly pregnant um but instead it's actually eric um who suggests marriage and eva doesn't want to get married so she says she didn't want me to marry her said i didn't love her and all that in a way she treated me as if i were a kid though i were nearly as old as she was and this is kind of eric's immaturity coming to the fore here that he is unable to see things from her perspective so he's unable to see the fact that she has every right to not want to marry somebody if they don't love her and every right to kind of refuse to marry somebody just because she's pregnant. And in a way, through Eric's descriptions, we're getting this impression of Eva Smith as quite a strong moral character, um, that she was potentially a feminist, that she didn't just want to get married just because she was pregnant. Um, however, he did financially support her so he um was giving her money until she refused to take any more so again this is showing us the morals and ethics that eva smith had um so he gave her about 50 pounds in total which would have been quite a lot of money um and here we're kind of getting an idea of why so burling is shocked that he had that level of money and says where did you get the 50 pounds from and eric miserably 
admits again that he's committed another crime and that he's stolen the money from Burling and Co. He got it from the office. Um, and this is significant because Eric is the only member of the family to commit an actual crime. So the others have all done something wrong, but it hasn't been illegal. To fire somebody or get somebody fired isn't illegal. Stealing money is illegal. Um, and Burling immediately reacts wanting to protect his company. So he says, you've got to give me a lift of these accounts you, uh, to cover this up as soon as I can. So this is A, him wanting to protect his company, but also showing that upper class people immediately revert back to this idea of pretense and pretending that everything is fine rather than wanting to be honest. He's learnt nothing from the inspector's visit. He still wants to pretend that nothing is wrong, even though his son has been stealing and cheating the company. Um, and he said he calls him a damned fool and asks why he didn't come to him in the first place. And this is a key quotation for Eric when he says, because you're not the kind of father a chap could go to when he's in trouble. That's why. And again, this is acknowledging the troubled relationship between Eric and that should say Mr. Burling. Um, because there isn't a sense that um, he can rely on his father for support or help. In that situation he never actually went to him to be honest in the first place and that lack of honesty has forced him into committing a crime so here Priestley is showing that lack of openness and honesty is actually forcing people into worse situations than just acknowledging your faults and mistakes in the first place would have done um, and the inspector immediately interrupts this conversation so whenever the characters kind of go off track and away from the immediate topic, which is Eva Smith and what happened to her, he always brings them back and cuts in to interrupt them and says, you'll be able to divide the responsibility between you when I've gone. So this is a reminder that he's socialist and that he's speaking on behalf of working class people. Um, and Eric says, here, but how did you know that? Did she tell you? So here, Eric is starting to question how the inspector knows everything. Sheila was quick to learn that he's omniscient. He knows everything. He knows how each of the characters was involved with Eva Smith, what they did and the order that they did it in. And now Eric is starting to question where he's gotten this information from. Um, because he never spoke to her. He never spoke individually to Eva Smith. Um, and Sheila then says, she told mother. And then here... We're getting this revelation and this confrontation between father and mother. So we've already had it between father and son um, about the money that um, was involved in Mr. Burning's business when he stole it from him. And now we're looking at the um, effect of mother between father, uh, mother and son. That by not financially supporting Eva Smith, we have this very emotional speech from Eric where he accuses his mother of murder. And he says, then you killed her. She came to you to protect me and you turned her away. Yes, and you killed her and the child she'd have to. You killed them both. So the repetition of you killed three times is this really strong accusation, very emotive response from Eric to his mother, where he's directly accusing her of murder. And it's quite a big deal. Um, and they're both angry and upset and both blame each other. But you also have. Um, Priestley acknowledging how dangerous capitalism is because it puts everything down to a price everything is put down to money um, that here because of the lack of financial support Eva Smith ended up dying and so too did Eric's child um, unborn child I should add and you have all of these dashes and these dashes always show that somebody is emotional and distressed that their speech is quite broken up so there's going to be a lot of pauses, a lot of just bursting out and saying kind of, you killed her, you, she came to you to protect me. And you turned her away, like this really dramatic emotional response. And the inspector kind of brings it all back to this. He doesn't want one single person to take the blame because that isn't how socialism works. And instead reminds them that each of you helped to kill her. Remember that, never forget it. Um, so the inspector is aimed to teach them all a lesson about collective responsibility of socialism, that it isn't just one person who is entirely to blame, but actually each of them have their own parts to blame. Because after all, if she'd never been fired by Mr. Burning, she wouldn't have worked in Millwoods, so Sheila wouldn't have met her. Um, if Sheila hadn't met her, then she wouldn't have got fired. 
and ended up in the palace bar and so on and so on that it's this chain of events that socialism relies on which is to blame um and eric ends with saying unhappily my god i'm not likely to forget so he's admitting that he's learned his lesson and showing that he is fully on board with um the inspector's socialist message so that's the end of the annotations for today's lesson so you need to return to the original video so you can continue with the activities for today thank you for watching